to uh, explain a little bit about the Buddha's awakening, um, how it happened, how it took place. Um, and first of all, I would like to ask permission to my seniors, Awasarai Swamad, to, to give the first portion of this talk. It actually touches uh, on a few points that we discussed today, which will be, I think will be really interesting to, to hear. And uh, since I'm like the, the joy advocate in this, uh, <laughs> this, uh, this particular teaching, um, uh, I'll take the, the lead into the, uh, the aspect of awakening of the Buddha, which involved discovering the jhanas and that this kind of jhana and joy was the way to awakening, which was a major discovery on his path. So especially for us here, uh, I think we practice very uh, closely to this. Uh, for many of you here, I think, no, already. Uh, <laughs> so, um, this touches upon a, a sequence that I, <coughs> I call the gladness to collectedness sequence, which is found in very many suttas, in fact, where the Buddha is explaining. Um, this is found in Liga Nikaya number two, Samayapala Sutta, the fruits of the monastic life or anybody that really devotes themselves to this path. Uh, and the next 11 suttas after that, but it is sometimes overlooked because uh, in the Pali edition, it's written dot, 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 pe, peyala, meaning repetition. <laughs> so people don't tend to put a lot of emphasis on that, uh, on that particular extremely important stock passages. Um, and so, in the Pali, it says, Tasime panchehi nivarane pahine pamoja jayati pamoditasa piti jayati piti manasa kayo pasambati pasada kayo sukkang patisangvari sukino chittam samadhyati And so this is the sequence here, and it says basically, um, for one who's abandoned these five hindrances of the mind, then pamoja arises. And in my own translations, I always very often translate pamoja as relief. Because if we look at the simile right before that, uh, the Buddha explains this as um, being like free from debt, free from slavery discovering an oasis in the desert. <laughs> so we, we can imagine that's kind of relieving. <laughs> and um, really beautifully illustrates what this is meant to bring up in us. So, and then he says, once, once this relief happens, because of this relief, then there's joy, there's piti, there's, there's gladness about this. 
and because of the joy, the body itself becomes calm. It calms down. Um, of course, we can help it along and calm it down a little bit further, but technically this is what happens. And from a calm body, one experiences sukha or ease or happiness. And sukhino chittang samadhyati, that means the happy mind becomes collected, becomes samadhi. And so here, this is, uh, this is very vital for us to understand this, because this samadhi, this, this is how it's attained. Uh, many, many, uh, many different opinions have arisen about how to attain samadhi. But when we look at the suttas, this is, uh, this is how the Buddha dis explained it. And this directly correlates with the seven supports of awakening, the seven bojangas. So without further ado, <laughs> I usually cut the beginning of this because um, it's, it's talking about this encounter with uh, Satchika, basically, and Agivesana, and they have a bit of like that, that kind of debate. But the section you were speaking of is in that section, so. So basically now the Buddha is encountering Satchika. And Satchika is a clever debater. He's uh, the son of a very famous spiritual uh, tradition, which is the Jaina tradition, uh, the Nigantas. He's the son of the Niganta, basically. And he was very famous. He was known to crush everyone else's opinions with his mind. <laughs> and so he really liked debating, and he encounters the Buddha. And he starts speaking about um, how some people develop um, the body, some people develop the mind, and that the Buddha was mostly developing the mind but not the body, and such and such. I'm not going to go into great details because it's not really the core of what we want to be speaking of tonight. But Here, there was never arisen in Master Gotama a feeling so pleasant that it could invade his mind and remain. Here, has there never arisen in Master Gotama a feeling so painful that it could invade his mind and remain? Why not, Agivesana? Here, Agivesana. Before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, I thought, household life is crowded and dusty. Life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robes, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. And here we just basically make it complete. It's two different suttas, which is the Noble Search and the Mahasachika Sutta. So they're the two main discourses on awakening of the Buddha. Later, while I was still young, a black-haired young man endowed with the blessing of youth in the prime of life 
Though my mother and father wished otherwise, and wept with tearful faces, I shaved off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and went forth from the home life into homelessness. Having gone forth, because in search of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I went to Alara Kalama and said to him, Friend Kalama, I want to, he I want to lead the holy life in this Dhamma and discipline. Alara Kalama replied, The venerable may stay here. This Dhamma is such that a wise man can soon enter upon and abide in it. Realizing for himself through direct knowledge his own teacher's doctrine. And see here, this loops through yesterday when we talked about somebody gaining faith, unwavering faith, and not needing any other support than his own faith, not even the teachers. So we can see that this was actually already kind of in place before uh, this kind of concept of stream entry. I soon quickly learned the Dhamma. As far as mere lip reciting and rehearsal, we would probably say theoretical <laughs> understanding of his teaching of his teaching went. I could speak with knowledge and assurance, and I claimed I know and see. And there were others who did likewise. I considered it is not through mere faith alone that Allah Rakalama declares. By realizing for myself with direct knowledge, I enter upon and abide in this Dhamma. Certainly Allah Rakalama abides knowing and seeing this Dhamma. Then I went to Allah Rakalama and asked him, Friend Kalama, in what way do you declare that by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge, you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma? And here, uh, Dhamma means so many things. Uh, so we, we need to put a little bit of context here. And it, this particular context here probably means a state. This Dhamma is probably more like a state of particular meditation practice or understanding. So it's not just a teaching, but it's probably a state he's referring to. So how does he enters upon and abides in that state, basically? In reply, he declared the base of nothingness. I consider not only Allah Rakalama has faith, energy, mindfulness, collectedness, and discernment. I too have faith, energy, mindfulness, collectedness, and discernment. Suppose I endeavor to realize this state that Allah Rakalama declares he entered upon and abides in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. And so that also points to uh, an aspect that uh, we were speaking today about realizing this for yourself also. It's not only just uh, following blindly, we have to actually uh, practice and figure it out on our own. I soon quickly entered upon and, re and abided in that Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. Then I went to Alara Kalama and asked him, Friend Kalama, is it in this way that you declare that you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma by realizing for yourself and by direct knowledge? That is the way, friend. It is in this way, friend, that I also enter upon and abide in this Dhamma, in this state, by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. It is a gain for us, friend. It is a great gain for us that we have such a venerable one in our companion, as our companion in the holy life. So the Dhamma that I declare I enter upon and abide in by realizing for myself with direct knowledge is the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in by realizing it for yourself with direct knowledge. 
So it's a bit thick here. <laughs> but really, all this means is that they're kind of confirming each other's uh, state. And they're basically saying, well, yeah, I've seen this. I've experienced that, what you just said. And I also experience it. And now he's been invited to lead with Ala Rakalama, his whole Sangha, basically, uh, to give him the position of a teacher, which was very high uh, for him, at just beginning his homeless life, the life of a Samana. Thus Ala Rakalama, my teacher, placed me, his pupil, on an equal footing with himself and awarded me the highest honor. But it occurred to me, this Dhamma does not lead to disenchantment, dispassion, to cessation, peace, direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana, but only to reappearance in the base of nothingness. Not being satisfied with that Dhamma, disappointed with it, I left. And again, this touch upon uh, something that was discussed with quite a few people today. Um, on um, how deep this teaching is, how profound. Uh, you know, this, this is already quite profound here where we're speaking about the base of nothingness and attaining this. And the Buddha right away noticed that, hey, this is not Nibbana. <laughs> and there's, his intuition was amazing. It was just like, uh, I, I don't even, I can't probably even imagine, uh, but his intuition was such that he, he knew that there was a deeper release from that. There was a, an actual completely, utterly more uh, um, transcending uh, liberation. Because in, in this particular space, the plane of nothingness, there is still awareness. And um, in fact, we, we see this kind of teaching nowadays uh, being quite popular also when we talk about the self uh, being just this pure awareness self. You know, this is very common teaching. Uh, and I mean, I, I followed that for a while, so I know, <laughs> I know what, what this is. Um, um, but it doesn't actually... Uh, bring to the full cessation of uh, dukkha and the Four Noble Truths and the cessation of consciousness, also independent origination. And this is very, very profound. We need a very sharp discernment to actually see that. And the Buddha is just beginning and he's just saying, no, this is, there's something deeper than this. Still in search because of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, very high ideals. I went to Dakaramaputta and said to him, Friend, I want to lead the holy life in this Dhamma and discipline. Dakaramaputta replied, The venerable one may, may stay here. This Dhamma is such that a wise man can soon enter upon and abide in it himself realizing through direct knowledge his own teacher's doctrine. I soon quickly learned the Dhamma as far as mere lip reciting and rehearsal and his teaching, of his teaching. I could speak with knowledge and assurance and I claimed I know and I see. And there, we, and there were others who did likewise. And so now I'm just gonna skip over this because this is exactly the same format. And he's only saying, basically, that he declared the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Instead of nothingness, he went a little step further, where there is that strange kind of state where there's not even, there's even the letting go of this continual awareness. Of, and then there's a neither perception nor non-perception. But there's not a full breakthrough to Nibbana, really. So the Buddha, again, is not satisfied <laughs> and decides that this is not enough. <laughs> Thus, Buddha Ramaputta, my companion in the holy life, placed me in the position of a teacher and accorded me the highest honor. 
But it occurred to me, this Dhamma does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana, but only leads to reappearance in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Not being satisfied with that Dhamma, disappointed with it, I left. Still in search, because of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I wandered by stages through the Magadahan country until eventually I arrived at Uruvala at Se Senanigama. <clears throat> there I saw an agreeable piece of ground, a delightful grove, with a clear flowing river with pleasant, smooth banks, and nearby a village for alms resort. I considered this is an agreeable piece of ground. This is a delightful grove with clear flowing river with pleasant, smooth banks, and a nearby village for alms resort. This will serve for the striving of a clansman intent on striving. And I sat down there thinking, this will serve for striving. Um, this is the first uh, section that I find very inspiring because he was not just uh, looking for, uh, I guess, a, a boring place to be in. <laughs> he was looking for a place where there was quite, quite a lot of natural beauty, in fact. And he was very inspired when he saw when he saw Bodhgaya, which was not bearing that name at that time. Um, he was inspired by its smooth banks, its beautiful river, and uh, the tree, and uh, decided this will serve for striving. So there's a certain element of comfort, even though there's not really strong attachment to this, it, it definitely does help. It does help to be surrounded by this beauty, and uh, here we, we are in Bodhgaya. Uh, with the little remains of what, what this means. Uh, <laughs> it's a little dry, but <laughs> this area is well, uh, well watered. <laughs> so, so we have it. This was actually a, a, a forest in the past. So this uh, is quite a, all of Bihar, I hear, was much more uh, luxurious. Is that the word, the luxurious or the? Luscious, luscious, yes. I knew there was something wrong. <laughs> this will serve for striving. And so this, this reminds me of uh, where, where I live in uh, Sri Lanka. It's a very beautiful uh, forested area where uh, a lot of monks really do resonate with that also. And I know there's, there are many of us here actually that do resonate with this natural beauty and seeking this like beautiful silence of the forest and uh, finding it quite quite supporting for our practice actually very much. Now these three similes occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. Suppose there were a wet sappy piece of wood laying on in the water, and a man came with a fire stick thinking, I shall light a fire. I shall produce heat. What do you think, Agivaisana? Could that man light a fire and produce, and produce heat by taking the fire stick and rubbing it against the wet, sappy piece of wood lying in the water? <laughs> it sounds like an obvious no. Why not? Because it is a wet, sappy piece of wood laying in water. <laughs> Eventually, the man would reap only weariness and disappointment. So too, Agivesana. Agivesana is just the nickname of Satchaka, so just so you know. As to those recluses and Brahmins who still do not live bodily withdrawn from sensual pleasures and whose sensual desire, affection, infatuation, thirst, fever for sensual pleasures has not been fully abandoned, let go of internally. Even if those good recluses feel pain, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme awakening. So that's very interesting, just this statement here. Um, 
and we really see his like he's starting to draw the map of his own awakening here by determining where are the boundaries uh, and these central desires we say central desires a lot but it's it's just engaging the mind in so many things and we're really good at that nowadays uh, with phones and technology uh, you know, it's not just like a craving for ice cream. It's also just <laughs> engaging the mind all the time. Engaging, engaging, engaging. And there's never any viveka, disengaging from it. So this is very important. Uh, again, Nagi Vesana, a second simile occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. Suppose there were a wet, sappy piece of wood laying in on the dry land, far from water. And a man came with a fire stick thinking, I shall light a fire, I shall produce heat. What do you think, Agi Vesana? Could that man light a fire and produce heat by taking a fire stick and rubbing it against a wet, sappy piece of wood, but laying on dry land? No, Master Gotama, why not? Because it is a sappy, wet piece of wood. Even though it is laying on dry land far from water, eventually the man will reap only weariness and disappointment. So this is something that I did. When I, I studied in uh, adventure tourism, so I, I studied how to guide people in the wilderness and climb mountains and go on canoe trips and things like that. So this is <laughs> what I did in the past. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we had uh, these survival courses. And um, one of these things was uh, to learn to light a fire with two sticks. <laughs> and so it, it's, it's actually a really hard thing to do. And you, you really need very dry wood to do this. It's completely impossible if you have any kind of wet or sappy wood. So I just love how the Buddha had actually this knowledge, like very earthy, down to earth, you know, like uh, India 2,600 years ago. Uh, as a prince, he would like learn all these things. Uh, how to like when you're stuck in the jungle, what do you do? You just like light a fire and try to survive. And he probably had this uh, uh, this kind of knowledge also um, before doing before doing all this. So he's think of this as he goes. So to Agivesana, as to those recluses and Brahmins who live bodily withdrawn from sensual pleasures but whose sensual desires, affection, infatuation, thirst, fever for sensual pleasures, constantly engaging their minds, has not been fully abandoned and let go internally. Even if those re good recluses and Brahmins feel painful, racking, cursing feelings due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision, supreme awakening. And even if those good recluses and Brahmins do not feel painful, piercing feeling due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme awakening. This was the second simile that occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. And of course here he is really uh, relating to this, uh, this Jain practice of basically uh, that karma needs to be purified through painful action, tapa, basically. And that's what uh, a lot of people signed for at this time, was this idea that the purification of mind and karma came through the self-mortification or self-penance. Again, Agi Vesana, a third simile occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. Suppose there were a dry, sapless piece of wood laying on dry land, far from water, and a man came with a fire stick thinking, I shall light a fire and I shall produce heat. What do you think, Agi Vesana? Could the man light a fire and produce heat by rubbing it against dry, sapless piece of wood laying on dry land, far from water? Yes, Master Gotama. Why so? because it is a dry, sapless piece of wood laying on dry land far from water. So too, Agi Vesana, as to those recluses and Brahmins who live bodily withdrawn from sensual pleasures and whose sensual desires, affection, engagement, thirst, fever sensual, for sensual desires has, not been, has been fully abandoned and let go internally. 
even if those good recluses and Brahmins feel pa piercing, painful feeling due to exertion, they are capable of knowledge and vision and supreme awakening. And even if these good recluses do not feel racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are still capable of knowledge and vision, supreme awakening. This was the third simile that occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. These are the three similes that occurred to me. So it's quite eloquent how he's saying, well, however much you torture yourself, <laughs> uh, if you're still engaging in all of these activities, then your mind is never going to get calm. It's never going to experience peace. You're never going to be able to go deeper enough to actually get to Nibbana. So that is the ground, that is the basis upon which we can build a really wholesome practice afterwards. So it's not about just lust and craving and all these things, it's actually about constantly engaging the mind in many things of the senses. And here he goes on to describe all the tapa that he's done all the painful austerities that he's actually practiced. Now he started with his two teachers and they showed him the way to nothingness and neither, non, neither perception or non-perception, which I call the, kind of the limit of awareness, basically. And so he was dissatisfied because he thought this is not leading to Nibbana, not the full release. And there are, I think I've heard of like countless theories about what these are and how these teachers taught these. Uh, I've heard that this was like the, that one point in concentration yogi practices. I've heard that, um, personally I think that when he talks about mere lip reciting and theories and things like that, I, I hear a lot of, um, uh, of teacher nowadays uh, that talk about non-dualism and all these things and they say very very similar things to that where you just sit in satsang basically and through listening to always what the teacher would say you would continually kind of get that state basically where there's just that pure awareness kind of thing um, that's my personal understanding of it it could be anything but we honestly we don't have the proof for any of that so uh, we'll just leave it as uh, pure imagination for them. I thought, so now he's, he's disenchanted with his teacher's teaching and he's thinking, well, I'll just go all in to the James practice and I'll be with these five ascetics and we'll just practice together and we'll just like support each other because especially as, as samanas, as people who go forth and leave everything behind. Sangha, having other who do the same thing, is highly, is quite, uh, is quite uh, a big thing for us to, to be supported in what we do. For example, in monastic life, um, it's, it's uh, always, um, you know, being alone all the time is, is is really good, but there is always time where you need, you would need help, or you know, you would kind of, you want to talk about what you discovered, or you know, make progress. So it's kind of, it's like very, very hard on your own, uh, even though it's like a balance we try to strike. So now he's going into all these austerities. Suppose with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth. I beat down, constrain, and crush mind with mind. So with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I beat down, constrained, and crushed mind with mind. While I did, I did so, sweat ran from my armpits, just as a strong man might seize a weaker man by the head or shoulders and beat him down. That's a little violent. <laughs> constrain him and crush him, so too with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed on the roof of my mouth, I beat down, constrained, crushed, and crushed mine with mine, and sweat ran from my armpits. 
But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, really forcing this, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. And so actually it's interesting to, to know that a lot of us will go through that. A lot of us, uh, and I can take myself as an example, there was a time where I was practicing other kinds of practices and I pushed myself very hard in like a very painful lotus pose and uh, my legs are very thick so I really have to crank my ankles up and I blew my knee. And I wasn't able to meditate for two, three months. And, and through that, through all the pain, and I realized, well, that's kind of pointless. <laughs> I mean, if I'm going to do that and wreck my body, then what's the point? And, and then I did that many times. <laughs> and then I finally understood that, well, maybe that's not the way. <laughs> so I, I like that the Buddha is actually, he's not the only one, and I've heard many, many, many stories of people injuring themselves and like pushing their practice so far and they have to back off and thinking, Ajahn Viradamo is also another monk who's talking a lot about this, uh, how he was like, you know, so many years he's tried to push meditation, push meditation, push meditation to the point of hurting and that's, after so many years, you just, you just know, like, no, <laughs> no, I'm not doing this anymore. Like, this is not the way, you know. <laughs> but there's got to be another way. And that's like, this is exactly what the Buddha is going through. And it's such a universal truth. Like, so many people actually go through this, this thing. I thought, again, suppose I practice the breathing less meditation. So I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth and nose. Great idea. <laughs> While I did so, there was a loud sound of wind coming out from my ear holes. Just as there, just as there is a loud sound with a smith's billows, when the, smith, when the smith's billows are blown, so too, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through, through my nose and mouth, there was a loud sound of wind coming out from my ear holes. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and not calm at all because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such pain but such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. The Buddha was also asked at one point if, um, any, uh, if his mind was invaded by the hindrance uh, at any point in his career. And he said, ever since I took the rose, I think that's what he says, everything I went pabaja, ever since I, he left everything, his mind was so determined that he was just in this uh, very uh, powerful uh, uh, direction. And, and sometimes uh, when, when Papaja is done properly, when the going forth is done properly with the really good intention, very genuine intention, people really do notice this, that it's a very big commitment and a lot of the baggage that was before doing this is actually left behind. Um, so that's just, a, I guess, an interesting parenthesis on the power of this kind of determination. And uh, Suppose I practice further the breathing less meditation. So I stop the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears. Great. <laughs> I don't know how to do this. <laughs> While I did so, violent winds cut through my head. Just as a strong man were to crush my head with the tip of a sharp sword, so too, while I stubbed the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears, violent winds cut through my head. 
But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful striving, such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. So he was just pushing his body so much, even though his mind was so strong and determined. And, uh, it didn't invade his mind, but he couldn't actually, even though he was the Buddha, he, he had all the 32 characteristics of a great man, and he was basically like described as a superhero, almost, like the way he's described, like the torso of a lion, and like the legs of an antelope, you know, that's pretty intense. And even pushing his perfect body to the limit, he, he realized, like, I can't do this. Like, there's no way I can break through like this. So this is really interesting. I suppose, suppose I practice further the breathing less meditation. So I stub the in-breaths and out-breaths through my nose, mouth, and ears. And while I did so, violence, violent winds carved up my belly, just like a skilled butcher's knife or his apprentice were to carve up an ox's belly with a sharp butcher's knife, so too while I stop the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose and ears, violent winds carved up my belly. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such, such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. I thought, suppose I practice further the breathing less meditation. So I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears. While I did so, there was violent burning in my body, just as if two strong men were to seize a weaker man by both arms and roast him over a pit of coals. So too, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears, there were violent burning in my body. But although tireless energy was arose in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. Though such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. Now when the deities, the devas, saw me, some said, the recluse Gotama is dead. Other deities said the recluse Gotama is not dead. He is dying. Other deities said the, Go the recluse Gotama is not dead nor dying. He is an arahant, for such is the way arahants abide. <laughs> um, I thought, suppose I practice entirely I don't know if you've seen those uh, sculptures of the Buddha at that point uh, in Sri Lanka, very, uh, quite striking. <laughs> if you've uh, ever seen this, where uh, he's uh, sitting with, basically he's basically looking like a skeleton with some kind of film on him and the, his veins are jutting out and he's not looking very happy. Uh, eyes sunken in the sockets and everything, so. So apparently this wasn't enough. <laughs> then he turns towards food, he thinks, and then it must be food. Then the thing that's missing that I'm, I'm just, I'm just greedy for food. That's that's what my problem is. <laughs> I thought, suppose I practice entirely cutting off food. Then deities came to me and said, "Good sir, do not practice entirely cutting off food." If you do so, we shall infuse heavenly food into your pore, into the pores of your skin, and you will live on that. I considered if I claim to be completely fasting while these deities are infusing heavenly food into the pores of my skin, and I live on that, then I shall be lying. So I dismissed those deities saying, there is no need. <laughs> So, very virtuous also. <laughs> I thought, suppose I take very little food 
a handful each time, whether of bean soup, lentil soup, or vetch soup, or pea soup. So I too, so I took very little food, a handful each time, whether of bean soup, lentil soup, vetch soup, or pea soup. While I did so, my body reached a state of extreme emaciation. Because of eating so little, my limbs became like jointed segments of vines or bamboo stems. Because of eating so little, my back, my backside became like a camel's hoof. Because of eating so little, the projections on my spine stood forth like corded beads, like a mala in the spine. Because of eating so little, my ribs jutted out as gaunt as crazy rafters on, a, on an old roofless barn. Because of eating so little, the gleam of my eyes sank far down in their sockets, looking like the gleam of water that had sunk far down in a deep well. Because of eating so little, my scalp shriveled and withered as a green bitter. A green bitter gourd shrivels and withers in the wind and sun. Because of eating so little, my belly skin adhered to my backbone. And thus, when I touched my belly skin, I encountered my backbone. And if I touched my backbone, I encountered my belly skin. Because of eating so little, if I defecated or urinated, I fell over on my face right there. Because of eating so little, I tried to ease my body by rubbing my limbs with my hands, and the hair rotted at the, at the root fell from my body as I rubbed. So that's uh, not looking really nice. <clears throat> Now when people saw me, some said, the recluse Gotama is black. Other people said, the recluse Gotama is not black, he is brown. Other people said, the recluse Gotama is neither black nor brown, he is golden skinned, because this used to be his actual color, his skin. So much had the clear, bright color on my skin deteriorated through eating so little. And then his, his realization. I thought, whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past have experienced painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, tapas, this is the utmost. There is none beyond this. And whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future will experience painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost. There is none beyond this. And whatever recluses in the present experience feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost. There is none beyond this. But by this racking practice of austerities, I have not attained any superhuman superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the Aryas, the noble ones. Could there be another path to awakening? So for those who have been through uh, some of these practices, uh, I think this is a bit what the, the general understanding afterwards come. Um, And so being the Buddha, like I said, he had all these amazing qualities about his body. And he was a very, uh, a very strong person. The bull who could bear the load, as, as they say, as he was a Taurus, I believe. I think you're a Taurus too, are you? No. Oh, OK. You're born in March? Yeah. OK, nine? Yeah. That's not Taurus? It's Pisces. Pisces? Pisces. Well, I'm on the cusp too, Pisces, Aquarius, Pisces. 
Sorry, discussing zodiac signs here. <laughs> He's not a Taurus. I thought he was. <laughs> uh, born in March, but it's... Ah, moon and Taurus. There you go. <laughs> yes, whatever that means. Um, and this is where, okay, all of this comes to this point. So pay attention <laughs> to this very particular uh, place in the sutta because this is where he actually remembers a time in his life. Um, and all of this striving with all of his teachers, the five ascetics, all of this painful austerities come down to this moment of realization. I considered I recall that when my father, the Sakyan, was occupied while I was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with joy and happiness born of letting go. Could that be the path of awakening? Then, following on that memory, came the realization that is indeed the path to awakening. So, that's, that's why I say that if he was taught the jhanas before, then this wouldn't really make sense. So, um, that's why I kind of tend to lean towards that. And in other suttas, they, uh, it's said that the Buddha who discovered jhana, uh, I'm not sure uh, exactly uh, the ins and outs of everything around this, but um, to me, I think that the Buddha is quite uh, uh, genuine in bringing up this new kind of understanding where in the first jhana we have the joy and happiness that comes from letting go of engaging all the time, mind in everything. Uh, there are other meditation practices that do uh, actually engage the mind all the time. So it's, very, it's, a very different, it's a very different kind of practice. So there are many different kinds of meditation practices out there. But this one is really when all the hindrances, we let go of them, we detach. Viveka. Um, so all unwholesome states we let go, we detach from that, we disengage, and all sensory engagement, we basically let that go, release, relax. In twin terms, we would say six hours, but <laughs> this, is also, this is also universal in the suttas. Basically, we just, the six hours are the Anapanasati Sutta principles, and they're just organized in a way that it's really easy to understand. That's, that's it, that's, that's really what it comes down to. Um, and so he remembered when he was a child with very few worries on his mind. His father is plowing the king, the, the father is plowing the field, the king is plowing the field, and that's like a, a, a festival, it's a happy time in his village. Everybody's kind of like, hey, look at the king plowing the field. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> and he's just uh, under the tree, and he's just like, has all these really good conditions in his life, good karma, and he just sees that. But he's a kid, so he doesn't really know what's going on. But after all this, this memory comes back to him, and it's like, wow, this was really profound, actually. And I should look into this. <laughs> Thank you. And this is also a part that I quite uh, affection quite a bit too. And I thought, why am I afraid of that pleasure that has nothing to do with sensual des desires and unwholesome states? Why am I afraid of this? Like, there's nothing wrong with this. There's, it's a pleasure to be enjoyed. Like, why can somebody find like something to blame about this? He's just sitting there, blissing out. <laughs> All right, <laughs> great. <laughs> I, mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's something more wholesome. Uh, so I thought, well, I am not afraid of that pleasure since it has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. 
I consider it is not easy to attain that pleasure with a body so excessively emaciated. Suppose I ate some solid food and some boiled rice and porridge, and I ate some solid food and some boiled rice and porridge. Now at that time, five, five bhikkhus were waiting upon me. They're called bhikkhus even though the, the sasana wasn't started yet, but uh, that's another interesting, interesting information that it was still, it was present at that time. We didn't, uh, uh, So when I ate the boiled rice and porridge, the five bhikkhus were disgusted and left, thinking, the recluse Gotama now lives in luxury. He, is, he has given up his striving and reverted to luxury. So that's a pretty hard blow. Uh, I mean, he wasn't breathing or eating, and then he just found this amazing path, and he just thought, well, I, I kind of need to eat because it's really, like, I don't feel good right now. <laughs> so it's like, it's going to be really hard. And that's actually why we tell people to sit in chairs uh, for the longer sits, because if you experience too much pain by pushing a sitting practice and your knees really hurt, it's going to be really hard for you to discover the depth, the real depth of letting go to that, to that depth of, of what he, he discovered too. Because there are ways to work with the pain, which are really close to understanding the deeper aspects of early, uh, dependent origination and how you know, contact arises, feeling arises, feeling is mental. This has got nothing to do with a person or a self. It's just happening and we create tension around that. We automatically, we're, it's like in our kind of internal biological system, there's a lot of this, uh, uh, researches about this actually, that it's, it's really like, it's almost, it's like a visceral thing when we experience pain, we just like, we crisp, we just like, no, we just don't want it. And it's very, very subtle work to do to let go of that really intuitive kind of pushing away at that level. So we don't want to, we don't want to force like a painful approach. There are ways we can understand the pain and then it can actually dissolve. And then we can actually see that it's completely impersonal. That pain is a feeling and it arose in the mind and that's it. And if we don't feed it, then it actually fades away. But to say, like, just, just sit and like go through it is sometimes creates more problems. <laughs> and so we, we really encourage people to sit in chairs, be comfortable, and it's so much more worth it to not have that pain. And the mind will go much, 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 much deeper sitting for four hours becomes something that is in the realm of the possible whereas for me if you ask me even to sit for four hours cross-legged I'm I know it's going to be really painful so <laughs> but in a chair it's manageable and it's enough to actually see and break through So he's eating some food, and then the five ascetics say, we're done with this one. Now when I had eaten solid food and regained my strength, then quite secluded, letting go of sensory engagement, letting go of unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and imagination, or thinking and reflection, with the happiness and joy and happiness born of letting go. But such pleasant feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. So see, he's still, he's still not attached to this. He's just like, oh, this is, this is happening naturally, but he's, he's, he's not actually, uh, he's not making a big deal out of it. He's just like, well, this is nice, and this is like releasing my mind, but he's not actually clinging to it. With the stilling of thinking and reflection, I entered upon and abided in the second jhana. With the fading away as well of stronger joy, 
I entered upon and abided in the third jhana with the abandoning, with the calming of uh, disagreeable and agreeable sensations the perception of these two extremes basically the awareness and when it becomes very steady and equanimous and these sharp contrast of really like painful or really pleasant feeling it, it smooths out it becomes much more like there's no much not much that extreme happening anymore and there's this beautiful equanimity steadiness in mind when my collected mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfections, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to the knowledge of recollection of past lives. And did you go through this, these uh, TV jazz already? So, okay, so I'm not going to, I'm just going to skim over this. Because yeah. it's quite a... He goes through the three knowledges, but since Delson has already talked about this, um, I don't know what the, the, the readers. I don't think I've gone over this retreat. Oh, this retreat? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, I, um, how are you feeling? <laughs> <laughs> are you feeling some, it's for some uh, superpower uh, Explanation, or or we just skim over it and then go right to the Asavakayas. This is 36. 36, yeah. Maha, Maha Sachika Sutta, the, the greater discourse to Sachika. Maha Sachika, yes. Mm -hmm. You did not read this one. Read. Okay. Okay. Okay, very good. So we've decided. There was a consensus. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Very good. Let's explain all these people. Threefold knowledge. <laughs> the Tevi just the threefold knowledge. And this is basically what the Buddha had to go through to understand the law of karma, to understand his own previous past lives, so that he saw that samsara was without beginning. It came back. It went to a point where there is no beginning. There is no beginning to it. He couldn't find it. He couldn't find the beginning to where he was like... Uh, there was no first cause. Yes, yes, there was, yeah, this like Big Bang Theory. There was nothing before and then like dependent origination emerged. <laughs> so, so, uh, so he, he saw that and there's, there, he saw all of his past life and this, this is obviously coming with quite a bit of, you know, uh, uh, detachment, I would say, when you see yourself, you know, being born, having a particular kind of set of karma that's pushing you into that birth, and then seeing that you, you get these causes and conditions because of your previous karma, and then you die, and then, you know, you reborn again because of certain causes and conditions, you rebirth, whether you're in the Deva realm or you're in the Nirayas or in the, in the hell realms, it uh, doesn't matter, it's the same law of karma. Whatever you've done, and this all really ends up how the mind is, really. Uh, karma is, is really in the mind, technically. Um, how the mind is, if it's heavy at the end of the life, then it sinks. And then if it's light and uplifted and it has done much good, then it floats up naturally. It's just, that's it. And so for him to see that, because he didn't know that before, he had to see all of his past lives and then see the same principle applying for all beings, basically. Uh, and so it makes it very universal. Uh, and then bringing this understanding of karma, dependent origination, to the asavakaya jnana that we call the destruction of the taints, which I call the basically the complete stilling of either the effluence, the flowings of the mind and everything, and the, the river of being, the river of conceit, the river of everything that we might flow down, allow our mind to flow down towards. 
then he, he was able to dry up the streams, basically, and that's another simile that he uses. Because asava comes from the root shru, it's just the flow. Um, so basically, um, drying up the effluence. That's another way that it's being translated. OK. I recollected my manifold past lives. That is one birth, two, one birth, two births, three births. Oh, actually, it's um, it's ellipsed. Uh, yep. So I would have to go to another section four. Yeah, twenty-seven. When my collected mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfections, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to the knowledge and recollection of past lives. I recollected my manifold past lives, that is one birth, two births, three births, four births, five births, ten births, twenty births, thirty births, forty births, fifty births, a hundred birds, a thousand birds, a hundred thousand birds, many eons of world contractions, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansion. Knowing there I was so named of such a family with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such was my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life term, and passing away from there, I reappeared elsewhere. And there too, I was named, I was so named, of such a family, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my existence of, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life term. And passing away from there, I reappeared here. Thus with this, with their, thus with their, aspects and particulars, I recollected my manifold past lives. This was the first true knowledge attained by me in the first watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose, as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. When my collected mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to the knowledge of passing away and reappearing of beings. And it's interesting to, to, to notice that it seems to happen all at once for the Arahants. I'm, I'm not sure. I can't tell out of direct experience. But um, from what one can read in the suttas, um, it, it, it seems like it's actually happening in one night. And uh, so, because we were talking about this today, the Tevijas and how they happen. Um, so I'm just, want, I'm, I'm just curious to know if, uh, if he actually did have some ideas, you know, if he did, because usually people will recollect their past lives kind of gradually. Like they'll kind of see things gradually and they'll put the puzzle together and, you know, like this. But in here, it seems very good. Yeah. Like that would be to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is your karma. Mm -hmm. It led to the next step and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So actually, when you see this karma, mm -hmm. but then you also see the end of the You're getting to see it. Yes. Yes. And this is where we're slowly transitioning to part two, where yes. Delson will. <laughs> Enlighten us. Mm -hmm. 
with the divine eye which is purified and surpasses the human I saw beings passing away and reappearing inferior superior fair and not as fair <laughs> fortunate and unfortunate I understood how beings pass on according to their actions thus these worthy beings were who were, accord who were ill conduct in body, speech, and mind, revilers of the Aryas, the noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong views in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in a state of deprivation, in a bad destination, in perdition, in hell. Uh, yeah, in the Nirayas, to, to say the, the actual word. But these worthy beings who were well conducted in body, speech, and mind, not revilers of the Aryas, with right views, giving effect to these right views in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death, having reappeared, have reappeared in the good destination, even in the heavenly world. Thus, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and not as fair, fortunate and unfortunate. And I understood how beings pass away according to their actions. So this is karma, basically. Oh, this left. And now, the, usually, what, what I usually do in, in, in regular talks of mine, this is this is bold guy. You know, this is like bold guy in it. <laughs> but uh, I, I would usually skip over the te vijas, or the the two vijas, the two first, and I go right to the asavakaya, the, the the drying up of the defilements, because it's actually something that we we ourselves can also do in our practice. Like basically, that's what we're doing. We're drying up the defilements in our minds. So it's not only something that happens on the third watch of the night, even though it does, but it's also here and now what everybody has been doing uh, for, for this retreat and then their practice. So. so basically what you're saying is you don't need the first two knowledges for the third watch. Well, um, well some arhants yeah. do uh, uh, go through full arhantship using the, the tevijas, the three knowledges. But some don't. And I think that the most common thing that whether they do or they don't, I think what the, the like defining line is basically the last one. And the last one is even more interesting because it's actually a practice at the same time. It's not just a result. So that's why I kind of like to uh, I usually just mention that because I'm also from the Western context and people in the West really like the, you know, scientific, you know, not really a, a huge fans of past lives and things like that. So I am, but <laughs> uh, I understand that it's really not that popular where I'm from. So, um, well, it is, but we keep quiet. <laughs> When my collected mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfections, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to knowledge of the destruction of the taints, the complete stilling of the effluence, the defilements of the mind. I directly knew as it actually is, this is troublesome. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the origin of what is troublesome. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the cessation of trouble. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the, cessa this is the way leading to the cessation of trouble. I directly knew as it actually is, these are the distractions. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the origin of all distractions. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the cessation of all distractions. 
I directly knew as it actually is, this is the way that leads to the cessation of all these distractions, of all these effluents of the mind. When I knew and saw thus, my mind was liberated from the tendency of sensual desires, from the tendency of beingness, and from the te tendency of lacking awareness or ignorance. I'm kind of doing a little bit of a remix here because uh, this is usually what I use uh, in my own translations. Uh, but they're not available to me right now, so... Uh, I directly knew birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had been done has been done, what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. In the West when I say that, it's, it's, it sounds pretty terrible. <laughs> the destruction of birth, uh, people don't really like it. But, uh, so, I usually say uh, something a little bit softer, um, which is more like, uh, the end of coming into being, kind of thing. Or the, this end of coming into this constant beingness. Um, beingness is a word that I kind of like to use. Um, And I think it's actually a bit closer to what he's saying here. Um, this was the third true knowledge attained by me in the last watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose, as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. Now, Brahmin, it might be that you think Perhaps the recluse Gotama is not free from lust, hate, and delusion, even today. Which is why he still resorts to remote jungle thickets, resting places in the forest. But you should not think thus. It is because I see two benefits that I still resort in remote jungle thicket, resting places in the forest. I see a pleasant abiding for myself, here and now and I have compassion for future generations. And so that's why, uh, that's why the way we behave also is very important uh, because the Buddha is saying he has compassion for future generations. That's also what Kasapa said, Maha Kasapa Bhante, uh, when he was asked, well, you're, you're like a full arahant, uh, you're probably the, the eldest leading member of the Sangha when the Buddha passed, and why do you still go and so much time. In your, in your cave, in the hill, by yourself. And he's actually just saying the same thing. And he's saying, I'm leading by example, basically. That's what he's saying. Because if people see me just walking around, just like, woo it's like, <laughs> got nothing to do with anything. And uh, then they just think that, that's how you become awakened. That's how. That's what it means to be awakened. So, it's um, and I see this beauty in, in the sangha and the, in the in the way that uh, this is being preserved through the ages, and which is uh, such a wonderful gift to us all. Um, indeed, it is because Master Gotama is an is an accomplished one, a fully enlightened one, that he has compassion for future generations. Magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent Master Gotama. Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dhamma and the Bhikkhu Sangha. From today, let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge, for life. And this is how the Sutta ends. And so I think um, from here, 
he because uh, there are so many uh, suttas on awakening, on his awakening. And it's, it's not just one thing. He's actually he went through a lot of understandings, and he, they don't just don't do it in one sutta. <laughs> so you have to know exactly where to. You have a question? Yes, yes. Go. With. So yeah, uh, that, that's, uh, that's exactly what I was trying to explain be, uh, before uh, in that section, was that we don't actually have the real basis. Like, what do, what do they mean by he attained the base of the plane of nothingness? Because they don't actually say that it was through the jhanas. They, they talk about mere lip reciting and rehearsal, theoretical understanding of whatever teaching that was, but they never speak of any jhanas per se. So some people advance that that was jhana and that was like absorption jhana. Personally, I've heard probably a dozen different versions uh, that people think that's what it was. And, but the reality of it is they only say the plane of nothingness and they don't say how they got there. And then the next one is the same, the plane of neither perception or non-perception. We don't actually know what his teaching was. How did he get there? And he, he only says, now you know what Rama knew, which is also really interesting. <laughs> so um, uh, basically, for me, from what I understand, because I, I practiced quite a bit of Hinduism and yoga, and I've studied the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, and the Bhagavad Gita was my Bible for a while, and so, you know, I, I've kind of had this, also the dip in that kind of world vision or understanding, and I think that there are teachings that actually do point out to that, but in a very different way, not through the jhanas. And it's like the Brahma Viharas. The Brahma Viharas, the Buddha didn't make that up. It was already there because Brahma was known to abide in these only in these four states. Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Upekka. That's all. And so that's that's known to be how Brahma in the West I guess we would say God, but uh, abides. And this was such a profound understanding at that time that he kind of took this because it was extremely wholesome and it's also you know the way to Brahma he taught Brahmins how how to actually become in union with Brahma so he's not actually it's not that far you know when we talk about the Buddha's teaching there's so many things that are very very close and I think that's another thing that uh, he even talks about the Gayatri Mantra uh, in, in one of the suttas, you know, in, in, of all the hymns, the, 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 the Gayatri is the highest. So he's very close to the Vedas all the time. He knows all of that. So it's, um, to me, I just feel like, because if you know the Vedas, if you know the Upanishads, and you know that they're, they're, there's not really any mention of, first of Samadhi, there's not really mention of jhana, except actually in the Gayatri Mantra, which uh, Ajahn um, what's his name? Uh, no, uh, the one who made the, the one who has the website, Super Central Sujato. Sujato, yes. Ajahn Sujato actually has uh, really good things to say about that. Uh, that the root Dhi that is found in the Gayatri Mantra. Uh, what's the Gayatri Mantra? <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Dhi Mahi. Dhi Mahi. Dhi Mahi. 
Very good, very good. Yes, so he comes back twice in the Gayatri Mantra. And so it, some people think that he actually got that from there. Because the word jhana doesn't, it comes from dhi, really. It comes from that same word jhana in Sanskrit. So, uh, and I think that's probably what makes the most sense from what I've heard so far. Uh, and then he comes with the notion of samadhi, which was taken again uh, much later, integrated by you know, people like uh, Patanjali and the Yoga Sutras uh, and his elaborate scheme of that progression, which you're familiar with also. Um, but as far as we know, if you really are, you know, you really know the suttas and everything, uh, it's impossible to know. It's impossible to know exactly what, how did he get there. And I've heard a lot of different stories about it, but uh, we cannot really confirm. And since uh, in other suttas they tend to say that the Buddha actually awoke to jhana, which is, um, I don't, can you corroborate this? Uh, I think it's one or two suttas where the, it's said that the Buddha, he who awoke to jhana, who, he who discovered jhana. No, I would have to, <laughs> I would have to do some research again. But anyhow, so that's <laughs> very good. Yes? Yes. he just uh, he used all of his So basically, these uh, these 32 marks of a great man. There's, there's, there's a sutta called like this in the Diga Nikaya. <laughs> I'm not going to read it today. <laughs> I think people will fall asleep. <laughs> yes. Well, we could go into that, but that's actually uh, that was like these 32 marks were seen by the the, the people who came at his birth to declare the, the the prophet basically that that came to tell his future. And they said that he has all the 32 marks of a great man. And he's either going to be a fully awakened Buddha, or he's, or he's going to be a wheel-turning monarch, a Dhamma Raja. So, um, and then of course, uh, his father, the king, wanted him to be a, a king. Uh, so, um, but these 32 great marks, you know, they, they were something that they were like uh, very well known at that time. You know, it was really like a, if you look for someone really, really good, then you look for that. And <laughs> he just happened to have them all. 
ones. <laughs> and quite curious ones also, uh, yeah. just mentioning. <laughs> but, yeah, like his tongue can break. Like, yeah, and like uh, Mick Jagger's tongue kind of thing. <laughs> like, I could touch his like, forehead and go like this. Um, sounds like an interesting thing. Uh, and from there, I guess I was saying that um, there are so many suttas and you know, there's uh, seven trees. If you want to know more about this, there are, you know, when he awoke, there are, there's a succession of events where he sat down under the Bodhi tree and then he stood up and then he sat down into these various trees and had these various uh, kind of moments for seven days under each, each places. Um, and um, when we, Delson and I were walking uh, to the tree today, uh, I just thought uh, we would do a little collab on this because uh, <laughs> this is just such an amazing opportunity uh, being in Bongaya. And for me, I think one of the most beautiful, deepest uh, sutta on, on the rest of his awakening is a sequence that is found first in the Mahavaga of uh, the Vinaya, Pitaka, uh, which is very, very not well known. It's very well known in monastic life, uh, where uh, we, some schools like the Pa'ok schools, for example, will recite that quite a lot, the dependent origination up and down, basically the arising and the cessation of dependent origination. And there's a quite neat little verse at the end where it's telling about his insight Upon, upon that and you can just um, so I, I basically we were talking about like so who's going to do who and which, which one and uh, I think Delson is definitely the I'm more like the joy advocate and Delson is like the leading edge of dependent origination so I thought uh, that would be like a, a, good, a good one for, for him to actually lead and um, And you can just imagine the Buddha, he's under the Bodhi tree, and he's probably, you know, he's just broken through, basically. He's just like, saw Nibbana, which means like the complete blowing out of not only greed, hate, and delusion, Lobadosa Moha, but also of consciousness through the removing of all sankharas, without any sankharas, con consciousness cannot arise, and that comes from true knowledge, which is basically vijja. Um, and he's kind of like seeing this, and he's playing with it, and like we said, the computer rebooting, and like seeing this happening, and up and out, and up and out, and he's like, yeah, this is how it works. <laughs> and so, without further ado, please, Delson. So, does anybody want to take a quick bathroom break? Yeah. Please.